Uh, last week we talked about the struggle of the mind, and we're going to continue, but from a different angle this week than last week. I want to talk to you about cursed with reluctance. Cursed with reluctance. You know, and just talk in that area tonight. Praise God. And uh, so we're going to go to Exodus chapter 4. We're going to read verse 1. And then we're going to jump down to verse 10. And then we're going to jump down to verse 13. All right. So the Bible says, And Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not appeared to you. Then jumping down to verse number 10, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And then verse 13, but he said, O oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whoever, whomever you else you may send. All right, so we're going to talk about cursed with reluctance. Amen. So let's take a moment and pray. All right. We were just singing tonight, worshiping you, talking about how holy you are, my Father. God, and we sang the song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, along with expressing our love to you tonight, God. And we do need to have you open our eyes. We do need to see things different than we have seen them to this day. I ask you, God, again to begin to reveal and show to each of us what you desire of us, Father. Amen, oh God, that the entrance of your word would give light to us. Praise God. So as the psalmist said, open my eyes that I may behold the wonders of your law. And so tonight, God, we're asking for these very things. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Amen. There is tonight, of course, a struggle in our minds. Amen. A great struggle. And uh, many of us are cursed with reluctance. All right. There are, we're reluctant to step out, you know, and do what God wants us to do. In fact, reluctance controls our decisions. I'm not asking for any volunteers tonight to tell us how many times that God has dealt with us and we have had reluctance. It may be even reluctance to deal with, that deals with truth. You know, God has brought many of us out of many different backgrounds and truth has come to us and we've been reluctant to leave what we were familiar with, what we knew. Amen. And then there's that other side of, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Amen. About some of us are just unsure of who we are and what we're capable of. Amen. Are you, are you still here? So we'll just, we'll, just, we'll just spend a little time in this area tonight now. I'm not a psychiatrist nor a psychologist. I haven't come to put you on no couch. And amen. That's not going to happen in this house. But however, God will deal with our hearts, all right? God will talk to us about where we're at. Now, there are reasons that we become reluctant. Some of us in this house tonight are afraid. We're afraid. We don't know where the decisions would take us, which causes us to be reluctant. Some of us are a little, we're adverse. Some of us are averse to change. We're comfortable where we're at and we know that if we change, if we move, uh, it's not going to be very comfortable and so we are adverse to that. Some of us in this room tonight are backward. I'm not trying to be negative here, but we're just plain backward. We just I don't know if I can do anything at all. And, yes, and we, again, we will, uh, we will design our thoughts in that way as we dwell upon it. And then others of us are very hesitant. You know, uh, if you know anything about the NFL and most sports uh, on the professional level, it's down to seconds. A quarterback will throw the ball long before the, the, the receiver gets to the spot. 
And it's amazing how these guys have practiced over and over again. And, uh, and, and the, the guy catches it, although he threw it long before the guy even turned in that direction. And so if you're on defense, one of the things you want to do is you want to hold that receiver as long as possible at the line of scrimmage just to throw off the timing. And some of us are hesitant about God. We're reluctant in that area. And whether we realize it or not, we do throw off the timing. The Bible says in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. And some of us, in fact, sometimes I believe it's pretty intentional. We start dragging our feet because we're reluctant. And uh, knowing that, you know, hey, this is going to pass. And then I'm not going to have to deal with it anymore. At least for the, for the present. And then some of us are just plain indisposed. Man, we, you ain't getting me to do anything. I'm going to be what I am. Amen. I don't care what you think. And we just, and, and as a pastor, now you understand, I see people sitting in a congregation that are exactly like that. It's almost like they're daring you to somehow bring them to change. Okay, and I've, I finally learned, it took me a long time, I learned yesterday that I can't do that. No, I, <laughs> amen. And there's just, there's people that are very resistant in this area. And then, of course, there's people that loathe, literally loathe. They don't want to deal at all with uh, the aspect of being involved uh, in making a decision. And then, of course, there's that shy group. Would all the shy people please stand up? Yeah, they're not standing up. <laughs> if you're standing up, you ain't as shy as you thought you were. <laughs> you just, you, you, you just always like that, Lisa. And I noticed my wife actually stood up, which shocked me. Uh, but that's good. And then there's, the last is just unwilling. They're just, they're not going to do whatever God wants them to do. And obviously they're reluctant. And so this evening we... We're talking about being cursed with reluctance. Uh, being under. That's what we mean by a curse. Being under or, or afflicted with some condition that will keep us from fulfilling the will of God. I can tell you this much. To do the will of God is, is a joyful thing. Amen. To get involved in it is a joyful thing. Uh, there are many under the sound of my voice tonight that you know the disappointment have, have not having done what God wants you to do. And in fact, some of us have promised God that we would not do it again. Only to be put back in that situation and somehow we waffled, we come up with another reason why we couldn't. That's, that's the curse of reluctance. We just, we're not sure. We're not sure. Now, it'd be really bothersome if we were the only generation that has faced that. But throughout the Word of God, there are reluctant men and women, amen, who somehow, by the grace of God, get past what they are and allow God to work through them. I'm going to tell you what the biggest issue we have tonight is. You know what it is? It's simply trusting God. We are good at telling everybody how much we trust God. But that is our problem. We really don't trust Him as much as we say we trust Him. Hallelujah. And so, tonight if we could just learn, amen, to deal with the reluctance that we face. You know, I, I know how it is when, when I've knocked on doors... That first door is the worst door of my life. In fact, I have to tell you that when I have knocked on doors, I have literally, now this most of the time becomes an unanswered prayer, is God, don't let anybody be home. Why are you out knocking on doors? Well, I'm just knocking on doors because I'm supposed to knock on doors and, and all these other people out there, and they're out there because I'm the leader and i got to do this. And Oh God, I hope they're not home. Now, I know nobody else has ever thought like that. <laughs> I know everybody here has had to deal with that issue. In John, the 12th chapter, 
Uh, we all know that Jesus' ministry had a tremendous amount of resistance. Okay, tremendous amount of resistance. May I just say to you, as you live with, for God, as you walk with God, there is going to be a tremendous amount of resistance that's created against you. Some of it will come from people, and some of it will come from the enemy. He is going to come against you. Amen. If he can just keep you from moving at all, he will be well pleased. You know, once you get a guy like me rolling... You don't want to be in my way. Amen. I, I just prom you always want to get them before they take the first step. They're easy to tackle if they haven't moved. But if they got momentum, baby, you may want to get out of the way. Because you're going you're gonna to get impact. I remember back when I was dating my wife. And, uh, and her, her youngest brother, Mark, for whatever reason, I don't know if he didn't like me that day, but I was standing with my wife. This is, now, this is back when I was trim and thin. No, I, wait a minute. I've never been trim and thin. What am I talking about here? This, this, is back, this is back when I actually played sports, so I was in much better shape. And so he come running at me. I mean, he was going all out, and I'm, stand, I'm standing, I'm not moving, I'm standing up, and my wife-to-be is my wife -to -be is standing by me, and he comes plowing into me. Okay, but you understand, I played football. And so I didn't fall down, he fell down. In fact, he went backwards. And I, I wasn't actually, I just, just blocked. You know, cause this chart. Well, I still feel pretty good about this kind of thing, man. I got I got to deal with remembrance now because those days, my granddaughter could knock me over today, but not in those days. I, I need to come back. I was talking a little bit about resistance, wasn't I? And so, in the twelfth chapter of John, uh, verse forty-two. The Bible says, astonishingly, that nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. Among the rulers. But because of the Pharisees, they refused to confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. All right? So there was a reluctance to step out of the shadows and make a confession that Jesus was the Messiah and that you were choosing to follow him. And the reason that they chose not to step out of the shadows was verse 43. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Amen. If you're going to walk with God, amen, as you deal with reluctance, you have to come to a place in your life where you're, you're more concerned about what God thinks then you're concerned about what men think. In fact, the Apostle Paul would basically say, am I here to please men or am I here to please God? And of course, his answer was, I choose to please God. Amen. Amen. And so as you walk with God, you got to consider. Now, as a young person, amen, we have a tendency to want to stay in the, the shadows, Daniel. Amen. I mean, I mean, when you went to Washington, D.C. last week, I know you talked to everybody about Jesus. And the answer to that is... <laughs> yeah, the answer to that is what? <laughs> I won't push it any farther, son. <laughs> oh, my. How old are you, son? I remember those days. What church you go to? Yeah, I pray gospel church. What church? Yeah, I pray gospel church. What are you talking about? I remember those days. Ah, uh, the reluctance. Amen. We are held captivity by the opinions of others. Let me run that by again. We are held in captivity by the opinions of others. All right, and it creates. A reluctance in us. Amen. In fact, we are cursed with it. The day that you quit allowing men or women to influence you in your decision to walk with Jesus Christ will be a freeing day for you. That was not too many of us in the house, was there? 
But it is true. It is true that when we finally get past what everybody else thinks and consider what Jesus is thinking. In fact, did, did he not say, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. And so help me, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I don't care what they think anymore. It's good to get together with men and, and sit at a table in a restaurant and ask somebody to pray. You know what? You know what? One of the things we do when we go for men's breakfast on a Saturday, amen, the first guy that gets his plate of food is the guy that's got to pray. Hallelujah. And I know that that's challenging for some guys. Now, what I really do, I, I know that the prayer is not designed for me, and I know that they're talking to God, but I sure like hearing their prayers. In fact, it's amazing that I come into this house many a day, and we're, and we're supposed to be praying, and, uh, and I, I just wonder, you know, because I can hardly hear anybody. I, do, I love when people begin to pray. I love when I actually hear them praying out loud. Some people seem to think that we, we got a scorecard here. And so when Gene is leading in prayer, when he gets done, we're going to hold up the card. That, that was a four, Gene. Or that was a ten. Yeah. <laughs> All the day you get past that. You see, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. You got to remember who you are serving tonight. Who you are wanting to walk with. Nobody in this room died for you. Mama may have come close, but nobody in this room died except Jesus Christ for you. Hallelujah. There is another portion of scripture in the book of, of chapter 9. Amen. We, we, we're, we're introduced to Paul. And Paul is wanting to create havoc in the church. He has an intense hatred for the believers of Jesus Christ. In fact, they're called of the way, and he wants, he wants to destroy the way. Hallelujah. And of course, in chapter 9, God takes care of him, knocks him down on the road. And then he tells him to go to Damascus, but God does not give him any other instructions than just go to Damascus. How about that? That sounds like God. Now, he just does that all the time, doesn't he? He, he, he why, He's challenging you to have faith in him and to step out. So, so Paul goes to Damascus and he's in Damascus and you're reading the scripture that he's, for three days he's praying and fasting. He really, he really wants Jesus. He really wants to understand Jesus. Now, now the word of God teaches us that the gospel has been left in the hands of Men and women, in your hands, in my hands. I got, man, it really got quiet in here. It really got quiet. It's in our hands, ladies and gentlemen. Angels aren't going to do it for us. Now, God will cause angels to work with us, but angels are not going to do our part. Okay, they're not, they're not going to do it. And so here he is, he is in Damascus, and there's a man named Ananias, okay, a follower of God, loves Jesus, and the Bible says in verse number 10 that uh, he has a vision, and of course God says Ananias, so we know who he's talking to. He didn't say, hey you, Hey, all you know, he called him by name, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. And then God says to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for he, behold, he is praying and he has seen a vision that Ananias is coming. Now, I know we'd all jump on board at that moment. We'd all say, all right, man, God's talked to me. He's giving me a vision. Amen. He's telling me that the other guy's praying and that he realizes that somebody named Ananias is coming to talk to him. Let's get this thing done. But wait a minute. He hates us. 
<laughs> Are you sh- Is that really you, God? <laughs> And reluctance begins to seep in. And he says in verse number 13, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he not only knows that, he knows that he has come with authority to Damascus. Amen by the authority of the priest, to get anybody that calls on the name of Jesus and to gather them up and, of course, to bring them to a point of either recanting or or die. All right? Reluctance. Okay, now let me just meddle with you characters. (laughs) Some of you have had God talk to you personally. And ask you to do something. And you knew without a shadow of a doubt who was talking to you, how he did it. It may have been a vision. It may have been a dream. It may have just simply been an impression. And you dragged your feet. Okay, now I, I'm saying this thing because I could say, and I also dragged my feet. That is the curse of reluctance. The curse of reluctance. You talk to me, and I still don't do it. In fact, if you read in Acts, the ninth chapter, the Lord tells Ananias twice to go. <laughs> I'm getting old. Couldn't get that other finger up there. <laughs> he tells him twice to go. Has anybody, don't raise your hand, has anybody here had to been told twice by God to do something? The amazing thing is God told Ananias what exactly his plan was for Paul. That he would carry the gospel to the Gentiles. All right? Now, I know that none of us feel that We're an integral part of what God is wanting to do in this last day. That if God was to come to you and say, because you will go and do what I tell you to do, thousands are going to come to walk with me, you'd probably believe the devil was speaking to you. That's the curse of reluctance. Help us as believers tonight to say to God, Whatever you want, God, I'll do it. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go there, God. I'll do it. Amen. Help us to get past all that stuff that most of it we create in our own minds. You know, I, I tell one certain individual that comes to church, I say, you don't even need a devil. You're your own worst enemy. You know, and, and it's the truth of many. We don't need no devil. We'll talk ourselves out of doing things for God, and that is the curse with reluctance. Help us, God is right. Now, there are a number of other people. Let me just focus on one. Amen. And he, all the time he's ever mentioned in the Word of God, he's he's the man that came to Jesus by night. Most of us already. Sister Jackie, do you know who the man who came to Jesus by night is? I know, I just, you just woke up, man. You're on your way to work. And the pastor is messing with you? Oh my God, help us. How about you, Sister Ellie? Do you know who the man is? I I didn't hear that, sister. I'm an old guy that don't hear too well. Who? I I heard you. We're introduced to him in John chapter 3. Some of the most critical scripture that deals with salvation are found in John chapter 3. He came to Jesus, verse 1 says, by night. Amen. He, He has been impressed by Jesus. He has heard of the things that Jesus has done, the signs which have 
been done. This is the gospel of John. And John will say that the miracles that Jesus did were signs to believe in him. All right. And so he comes to Jesus at night. And Jesus tells him after he compliments him in verse 2, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I, I can't spend a lot of time, but the word see there is a euphemism for to obtain, to get a hold of. Amen. That's what it means. Because it would be contrary to what the rest of Scripture says, because Jesus himself would say the kingdom of God does not come with observation. And that the kingdom of God is within you. So he tells this man who literally is seeking the kingdom of God. That the only way to obtain the kingdom is to be born again. And of course, this is we're not talking about somebody that's never uh, ever opened the scripture. He is very, very intelligent. He is aware of what the Old Testament says. He himself is a teacher of the law. And he doesn't grasp what Jesus is saying. Okay? He assumes that he's referring to actually having to go back into his mother's womb and being born again. And I know I'm talking to the choir tonight, but you all ought to say amen. amen. You really do. You ought, to need, you ought to need to get with it. Amen. All right? You just get with it when we talk about the truths of God's word. Amen. Praise God. Or are you reluctant? <laughs> And so he didn't understand. And so Jesus would give further information in verse 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And since Jesus has spoke those words, there's been many people that have tried to interpret what he said. I'm telling you, we're not spending time here tonight, but you need to hear, amen, the people that understood what Jesus was saying were his apostles. And later on the day of Pentecost, after the outpouring of the Spirit, amen, and many Jews are, many thousands of Jews are there. We know there are thousands because 3,000 will be gladly baptized after they have received the word that day. Amen. And they hear Peter begin to preach and they get conviction in their heart. They come to a point of believing that Jesus is the Messiah. In verse 37 of Acts 2, amen, they will say, men and brethren, what shall we do? They've been convicted, they believe, and the answer comes back to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That is the salvation message. It's not my message. Peter spoke it a long time ago. Peter in chapter, Matthew chapter 16 had received the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. And, and old Nicodemus got a preview. Okay. He would ask, he would tell Jesus, how can these things be? And of course, Jesus would talk to him about faith. He would talk to him about cursed is the man that hangs on the tree. Amen. And then, amen, he would go away and we don't hear anything more about Nicodemus for a while. In John chapter 7, the Bible tells us the heat was just being continually increasing. You see, see I'd have sure loved to have been in the apostles' day. All my brother and sister, they were under heat persecution amen that day can come to us too and the Bible tells us that they were plotting to destroy Jesus in verse 44 of John 7 it says now some of them wanted to take him but no one laid hands on him they sent officers to try to grab him or take him and uh it just didn't work. And so these men would come back to the leaders and the leaders would say, why have you not brought him? And their answer was simply, no man ever spoke like this man. 
They got so mesmerized by what Jesus was saying that they forgot their purpose for what they were there to do was to bring him back to the chief priest and the elders. And of course, the Bible says in verse 47, the Pharisee says, are you deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? <laughs> There's one guy that's right among them. His name is Nicodemus. And then they said in verse 49, but this crowd that, this crowd that, does not know the law is accursed. In other words, they start looking at those guys and say, man, you guys are ignorant slobs. You just don't get it. Amen. And it's at that time that Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, said, verse 51, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? He just asked a simple question. One that in, in any other occasion, they would have been in absolute agreement with him. And their answer to him was, are you also from Galilee? Search and look for no prophet has risen out of Galilee. None. I pray that reluctance would be shed by all of us in this room. I really do. I pray that somehow we'll get past, somehow we'll get past ourselves, get past all the excuses, get past whatever our feelings are, amen, and just that we can put this curse to death. That it can lay down, get out of our way, and we can do what God wants us to do. After Jesus crucifixed in John 19, the Bible tells us of another ruler, and Nicodemus, the Bible says in verse 38 of John 19, after this, Joseph of, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took the body of Jesus, verse 39, and Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. What was happening? The man was getting past reluctance. The confusion of night was now becoming an open confession in the daylight. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? You got to get past that place where you hide. And you got to get out in the daylight where you are openly confessing that Jesus is Lord, that you plan to serve him. Amen. That is your goal in life, that you're waiting for his coming. Hallelujah. 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 Now, the amazing thing about these two men, okay, that, that I see through the scripture is, amen, they, they fully understand what's happening. All right, They know that when they take Jesus off the cross, they have defiled themselves. And if you know anything about the Jewish law, Jewish law you, once you have been defiled by a dead body, you cannot participate in the Passover. And when's the Passover going to take place? The next day. Actually, it's just hours away. All right. And they know that. But something has happened to these men. They have found the Lamb of God. I realize at this moment that they're not born again. I know that moment's going to come on the day of Pentecost when the church is born. Amen. But these men, listen... The, the, you got to understand, they had carefully planned this. These Nicodemus and Joseph had carefully... Do, do, you, do you come up with a tomb at the last minute? You understand, they're just hours away from the Passover when everything's going to shut down. 
All right? So they didn't go secure a tomb at the last minute. They were planning, all right? Not only that, but they approximately had, re had purchased 65 pounds of costly spices. Where are you going to find them when the guys are shutting up the shop for the Passover? But they had them. And no sooner had Jesus died, went into his courtroom, Pilate's courtroom, because comes Joseph and Nicodemus. And you know what? Pilate is astonished that Jesus is already dead. So how did they know? How could they prepare for the burial of Jesus? Now I know I'm going to say some things that I can't necessarily prove, but it just makes sense to me. When Nicodemus had first been introduced to Jesus, he was very impressed with the miracles and teaching. And, I, and he did not understand what it meant to be born again. So what did this man do? He did what any hungry, seeking heart does. He searched the scriptures and asked God for guidance. I'm going to tell you right now, this is going to be a little bit negative. You need to find people that are hungry for God. Now they don't come with a sign on them that says, I'm hungry for God. That would be so simple. It's so easy. They don't come with that kind of a sign. You know, they, they come in and their life is falling apart. Their life is a mess. Amen. The only time they use the name of the Lord and it's not to praise Him. But inside, they are a heart that wants God. And Nicodemus was a man seeking to know the Lord. Amen. Remember what we've already read tonight. When, he, when they came to that council meeting, and those men had not brought Jesus back, and Nicodemus had said, well, don't we need to just look into this a little further? And I'm using my words. And they had ridiculed him and said to him, Amen, do you think a prophet's going to come out of Galilee? You know? And you know what they had said in verse 52 of John 7? Search and look. Now I'm just going to bring out another thought here. The reason some of us are reluctant because we just don't know the Word of God. We know our complex jobs. We know pi or square and not round. Some of you won't get that one. <laughs> we know all kinds of things. But what do we know about the Word of God? What do we understand? And so because we have not sought, our reluctance is simply based upon the fact that we have no hunger to grow. And one of these nights, one of these days, oh, you know what? By the way, next, next Wednesday, we're going to begin a series of Bible studies on what the Bible says. What the Bible says about itself. What the Bible says about repentance. What the Bible says about believing. What the Bible says about baptism. What the Bible says about the Holy Ghost. What the Bible says about God. And it would be good for you to be here. And we're not giving you $10 because you shows up. Let it be built out of hunger and a seeking and a searching for God. And so, here's my conjecture. That when Nicodemus walked away from Jesus, he was not satisfied with his position. He was not satisfied with his understanding. And he began to look into the Old Testament concerning the Christ. 
And not only that, but Joseph seemed to be of the same kind of characteristic. And I can see those two men as they begin to go to the scripture and they begin to look, what does it say about the Messiah? And they begin to look at the messianic promises and prophecies and they begin to realize, you know, that Jesus fulfills all these promises. All right? And certainly, he was the Lamb of God. Okay? And Nicodemus could also said to Joseph, he had told me that when he was lifted up, all men would be drawn to him. Do you know what time the Passover lamb is slain? 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Now, if you study the scripture, when does Jesus die? It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon when he gives up the ghosts. I mean, now, the reason I'm saying that to you tonight is because these two men had to be pretty close to what was happening. All right, now this is conjecture. Now we, we believe that John the Apostle was there because Jesus had spoken to him and told him to receive Mary and to call her his mother. In other words, I give you her, her as your responsibility. But I'm just, just me now. I just wonder if Joseph and Nicodemus were hiding in a, in a tomb, waiting. Because the tomb was not far from where they crucified Jesus Christ. And, and we know the scripture tells us that he would make his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now, I, I suppose maybe you would not want your, you wouldn't care. And when you're dead, you won't care. But, but you understand they were crucifying men within a short distance from where they were burying them. And in most cemeteries I ever gone to, they're pretty serene areas. You don't hear people screaming. You don't see people dying. You know, they've already died and they're brought in. And, you know, it's a peaceful, quiet place. So I suspect that Joseph really, as far as tomb goes, you know, that wasn't his selection, but the tomb had been hewed out. Now, I'm spending a lot of time in this, but you, you need to see where these men are at. And so when they heard him say, it is finished. Father, I commend my spirit. They know that he was dead. And they went to work. And when they stepped out, it wasn't reluctance that was controlling them anymore. Now, amazingly, when they step out, okay, hear me. Jesus seemed to be a failure. All right? In fact, his cause seemed to be hopelessly defeated. And that's when these two men stepped out. Everything looked dead and wrong when these men shed their reluctance. Tonight, brothers and sisters, we serve a risen Christ. And he's baptized the majority of us in this room with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we have spoken in tongues as God's Spirit gave the utterance. In other words, we're not dealing with what looks like a hopeless cause or defeated Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's time to come out of the shadows. It's time to lay aside the curse with reluctance and say, you know what? I'm going to give everything I can to my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. And so now let me come home. Let me come home now. All right. So, 
Moses is on the backside of the desert with sheep. He's been there working with sheep for some 40 years. Now, Stephen will tell us in Acts 7 that this man had been very, very uh, gifted. Moses was gifted. Amen. He actually, not in the Bible, but it actually says in history that he had led an Egyptian army to victory. He had been the very reason that they had defeated an enemy. He had known the courts of Egypt. He had been educated in those courts. He was a man of privilege. But now he's on the backside of a desert. And probably in his eyes, he pretty much has deemed himself a failure. Now, I asked how many are shy. Is there anybody brave enough here tonight that is that could stand and say, you know what, I looked at myself one time as a failure too. Uh, there, there's, a, there's some hands going up. There's a lot of hands going up. Okay. Well, my brothers and sisters, that's one reason we become reluctant. Because we allow our past to hinder what God wants to do in us now. And there are sure some people that don't help us. Let me run that by you. There are sure some people that don't help us. They are quick, quick to point out our failures. They have a memory like an elephant. And they are constantly reminding you I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. You are helping nobody but when you remind them of their past. You're not helping anybody. Even if the past was yesterday. You must release everybody from their past. If they hurt you yesterday and they asked your forgiveness, you must release them from the past. If you don't, your relationship is quite frankly going to stink. Oh, I just feel like, man, I can feel something in this house right now. And... I know where I'm treading right at this moment because I sense it in this house. Forgive that woman for crying out loud. Your feet stink too, man. Forgive that man, lady. You married him and he was imperfect when you married him. Do you really think that you can make him perfect? That ain't happening. In fact, your negativity is going to prove otherwise. It's going to make him more of what he ought not to be. All right. You know what every man in this room wants? Are you ready for this? Well, Lisa seems to really have it going tonight. Oh, the first four minutes. <laughs> they want their wife to praise them. Well, I just... They do. Every time you remind that man of his failures, you're not going to accomplish what you intended to accomplish. You're going to make him more reluctant to stand out. And the moment you remind him, it's like you just, he's a whip puppy with his tail between his legs. You don't believe that? 
I'm a man. I know what I'm talking about, man. I know what men have told me. I know what's coming right now. You don't understand, Pastor. That's not what you said when you were marrying him. What do women want? <laughs> Amen. They want that man to have a relationship that hasn't got anything to do with SEX. Is this okay? Well, I just noticed Daniel just woke up. <laughs> I know. I, you're already awake, man. I know. <laughs> okay. Let me wrap. I said I was wrapping it up here. I know how to stretch things out. I'm sorry. So in Exodus 4, God has called him at the burning bush. We read through those chapters and we think it just happened in just a few moments. Not a chance. There were hours of contemplation. Coming into the presence of a holy God. Taking off his shoes. Trying to wrap his head around what God was saying to him. It was unique. He could not refer back to anybody else and say, other than, you know, my father Abraham had a visitation from God. This was his first visitation that is recorded in the scripture. He would be one that would write the word of God. Up to this time, all they've had is the audible voice of God. All right? And then God has the audacity to ask him to do something. And just like you, he says in chapter 4 and verse 1, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose. Now you've said something similar. Nobody wants what I have. Sister Cece, your testimony is the greatest gift that you have. Everybody's testimony of what God has done. My wife has a testimony that she has never done drugs, never smoked a cigarette, never has a drink touched her lips. And somehow she feels that that testimony is not as powerful as yours. I'm going to tell you, it's just as powerful. It speaks of a God that can keep us. It speaks of a God that can come into our life and we can make choices when we're young to live for Him in spite of all the pressure that's on us. Alright? So her, pre her testimony is very precious tonight. And so what does God say to Moses when He expresses His reluctance? What is that in your hand? God is so deep. <laughs> What's that in your hand? Well, the response of Moses is, it's, it's a rod. But that rod means something to Moses. Did you know that? That rod symbolizes his occupation. That rod symbol, symbolizes his identity. It, that rod makes him feel comfortable. He is familiar with that rod. All right? And what does God say to him? Cast it down. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, God is looking for all of us to cast down the things that we're comfortable with, the things that have symbolized us, the things that have defined what we are, our occupation, whatever it may be, God says you've got to get past that reluctance, so you've got to cast down what you know the most. All right? And so the Bible says he cast, he said, cast it on the ground, and he cast it down. And of course, this is a part of Scripture where I have my issues with God. It turns into a snake. 
I told Brother East, I ain't coming down to visit him. He wants me to come to Texas. He says, Brother, you got snakes there. Well, and then he go, goes through all this lame stuff about the cat and the dog or drive all the snakes away. And then his son comes here and just talks about he's just driving down the road recently and there's this big six-foot rattlesnake in the road. Oh, that, that's going to encourage me. Speaking about curse with reluctance, it hit me right between the eyes there. I ain't going, man. I hate snakes. All right. And so what you're familiar with, you need to throw it down. Because that's involved with your reluctance. That keeps you from doing what you need to do for God. So throw down what you are familiar with. All right? Throw it down. And then God says to Moses, reach out your hand. And now it's a snake and pick it up by the tail. Now here's my thought on this. Let God change it before you pick it up. <laughs> I don't know when it happened. But as he reached for that tail of that snake. You know, everybody wants to say that it was a snake until his hand touched it. I'm not sure. I want to I wanna be content with thinking that it, it became the rod before his hand ever touched the back of that snake. But anyways, God will change it. God will change it. The same thing happens. He tells Moses to put his hand into his bosom. He pulls it out. It's filled with leprosy. And then he says, put your hand back in and it's like a baby's skin. So it's not just a rod. It's what is common to you. If you're ever going to get past reluctance, you got to get past what you are comfortable and common with. I'm talking to a lot of you tonight. I know you. I know your struggles. I know how you have minimized yourself. And I know, amen, that God has more intended for you. He really does. But you're cursed with reluctance and every time you've had an opportunity to step out of that, you have resisted. And I'm telling you, you need to throw it down. Throw it down. Throw it down. Just throw it down. We need to see the operation of the gifts of the Spirit in this house. And when God filled you with the Holy Ghost, He made it available to you to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. You need to throw some stuff down. You need to throw what if down. You need to throw out, well, only a special, unique few in the house are going to be used. That's a bunch of baloney. You need to throw that down. I challenge some of you to let God work through you. And some of you carry with you the scars of your reluctance. Because in the past, God has spoken to you to do something and you didn't do it. And you have resisted so long that now you're afraid God's not going to talk to you anymore about those things. And that he's moved down the road. And you know what? He'll find somebody that will listen. And it may be somebody that's new. That just hasn't learned all the... There you go. I'll use that word. Hang-ups. My God, some of you have been around an apostolic church all your life. Or for 20 or 30 years. Oh, I think I feel like parking here. Chocolate cake and ice cream are going to have to wait a little longer. I'm telling you right now, some of you have been around this thing a long time. And you should be leading others in how to listen to God, how to... Express what God wants for this congregation. Well, we'll just leave it to the pastor. 
That's the curse with reluctance when you do those things. I know, I know that some of you, what has happened to you, you go through some kind of procedure where you resist God and God just sort of breaks out on you and now you're fighting with God and, and God, is, God is beginning to win and you go, oh, you just... And then it's sort of like dragged out of you. You make the operation of the gifts of the Spirit seem to be extremely difficult. When the Word of God says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And so if you have resistance, it's not coming from the Spirit. It's coming from you and your flesh and your reluctance. Now, I'm here to tell you, you can't exhaust God with reluctance. That's why He's come back and visited you numbers of times. You ain't going to exhaust God. But I'll tell you what will happen. We read it here in the Scripture. Verse, chapter 4, verse 13. But He said, O oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whoever else you may send. In other words, reluctance says, and send Daniel, send Jim, send Antonio, send, send Jean, send Tim, send John. And verse 14 says this, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. You can't exhaust God with reluctance, but you can anger Him. Can we bow our heads in this room this evening? Oh, Father, in this hour, I had no trouble talking about this subject tonight, Father, because you know how much reluctance has been a part of my life. And I was cursed with reluctance, God. It hindered me. It, uh, it made me, oh God, go only so far. It became, Father, like a glass ceiling. And I couldn't break through it. Oh, Father, in this room tonight, help each of us to throw down the familiar, to step into a realm where you operate, my God. We read in the Scripture, we did not use the Scripture tonight, Father. But just six verses later, Moses' rod is called the rod of God. Oh God, if we only understood what you want to do through us, God. Help us, God. Help each of us, God. Forgive me for my reluctance, Father. Forgive me for those times, God, that I argued with you and, and gave you all the scenarios where I couldn't do it. Basically, what I was telling you, God, that, you know, can't trust you. That you made the right selection. Surely you got it wrong, God. But I know enough about your word, God, to know that you never get it wrong. And that if you call us, faithful is he who has called us, and he will finish the work. So God, help every man and woman in this house, every young person in this house, to step out of the shadows just like Nicodemus did, Father. Just like Nicodemus did. He stepped out of the shadows at your death. When everything looked hopeless, I suspect there was something going on through your word that was speaking to him. Now we don't read about him in Acts. But if he stepped out at Calvary, I'm pretty confident that he stepped into Acts. Oh, Father, 
There are men and women here that you want to use, that you want to work through. And I pray, God, that you would help us to overcome reluctance. Oh, God, help us not to be cursed with reluctance. Help us, Father. Help us. That psyche that gets in us, it tells us that we can't. Nobody wants to hear that we're not good enough and everybody's better than us, Father. My God. That the truth that I have come to know, God, everybody's resisting it. So if I step out, they're going to resist me also. Help us, Father. Help us tonight to throw it down. What, from, what we're familiar with, what we know for sure, and step into that realm. Where you, the holy God, work in great ways. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Would you just pray with somebody close to you? Husband and wife, just pray for one another. Friend, believer, just, just find somebody to pray with. Just as, as we close. We're, we're closing ju ju in just a moment. Let's just ask God to help us. Oh God, raise up, oh God, a mighty army here. Raise up a mighty army here, Father, a mighty army.